Evil. Evil written in the face of the witch Morgan Le Fay. Power personified in the face of a demon from the sea. Figures in a world of fantasy. Frozen beauty stares forever into space. She hears no evil, speaks no evil, sees no evil. How strange they are, these idealized, glamorized reflections of ourselves. is back. The perfect woman. Over the last 30 years, they have quietly invaded our high streets. One can easily imagine them as visitors from another world, patiently waiting for someone to switch them on, to bring them to life. In some ways, it's rather a pity that they are but a shell of fiberglass by the hands and not the loins of man. In the studio of a leading manufacturer of shop window mannequins, sculptor John Taylor is creating a figure in clay of top international photographic model, Renata Zatch. From this figure, a set of molds will be made, which will give birth to thousands of life-size copies of Renata, which will be sold all over the world. A large number of the mannequins seen in shop windows today are replicas of real people. John Taylor portrays the person exactly as they are. He does not exaggerate the features in any way. At a later stage, when the mass-produced figure reaches the makeup department, a larger than life look is added by the clever use of makeup, eyelashes, and wigs. Renata's mannequin will display the latest in fashion to thousands of women from Paris to Brazil. friend, model Slifka, has also been sculpted by John Taylor. The workshops are run rather like a car assembly plant, but instead of radiators, bumpers and wheels, you have a profusion of hands, arms, legs and bodies, like a mass of spare parts for some petrified nudist colony.
in the makeup department, the figures under highly skilled hands gradually come to life. Since the makeup does not have to be removed each night, oil paints are used. The same face can be made up in so many different ways that even the girl who originally modeled for the figure is often surprised by the variety of looks that can be created. The models never begin to look finished until they have been crowned with a wig. Wigs come in hundreds of shapes, styles, colors and sizes. Many of the girls working here are qualified hairdressers. And styling, combing and shaping is carried out in much the same manner as in any ordinary hairdressing salon. The wigs are made on battered working heads, which in no way resemble the final model except in size. Once the curlers are out, they are never needed again. This is a hairdo that lasts forever. Large pins are temporarily driven into the head to raise the hair at the parting line. She's an awfully good hairdresser, but those nails, eh? they're so terribly painful. Did you hear that Fiona has landed up at you-know-where in Knightsbridge? So what? Confidentially, I've heard that some shake or other has ordered 24 of me in assorted colors. Nylon fiber, which has a shiny, colorful look, is used and many different shades are blended together. Experienced hands and a pot of glue, and an impressive hairstyle is in the making. is a special order portraying a whole series of famous Hollywood stars. Even without final makeup and wigs, it's not difficult to recognize them. The finished wig, looking soft and silky, is in fact as hard as concrete. Wig and head meet for the first time. The artist checks that makeup and hairdo blend well together. expert puts the final touches that create perfection. Top model, Kathy Sharif. Actor, Simon Ward. They will spend their working lives always immaculately dressed in the latest fashions. Only needing an occasional dusting down to keep them as they were the day they were born. achieved man's most cherished dream, eternal youth and beauty.
for some, there is a very different fate in store. In these dark, dank and dripping vaults near the Tower of London, man is portrayed at his most beastly. His cruelties and crimes perpetuated in wax and fiberglass. Father Gerard, a prisoner in the White Tower during the reign of Elizabeth I. He was tortured for his religious beliefs, but luckier than most, he somehow escaped and lived to tell his tale. To imprison a man was often not enough. He was bound with irons and chains and left in extreme discomfort. The scavenger's daughter, a device that locks the prisoner's neck to his arms and legs. most notorious and deeply dreaded instrument of torture in British history. It was invented by the constable of the tower in the reign of Henry VIII. It was designed to dislocate the limbs, slowly. But they're wasting their time on him. gibbet cage. Here the victim was left dangling until the flesh fell from his bones. A frightening warning to all who might choose to err. The ancient druids, a mysterious priesthood who carried out the monstrous cult of human sacrifice. The birth of a martyr. Thomas Becket, Archbishop of Canterbury, brutally murdered on the altar steps of Canterbury Cathedral by the Knights of Henry II. Queen Boadicea, a savage and merciless warrior. Models such as these created by some mad Frankenstein-like figure. A tormented soul creating for a black museum all the terrors of history. One might well expect it to be so. But in fact, many of these models have been made by two gentle old ladies in a small workshop off London's Portobello Road. Between them, Winnie and Lily have 114 years' experience of making wax figures. Because of the realistic finish that can be obtained and its ease of working, wax has always been the material most used for exhibition and museum figures. But they do have to be handled with considerable care. It's very easy to damage a nose or an ear or to knock off a finger. Lily Candy has been with the firm for 58 years. She thinks she'll stay. Winnie Mills, workshop manager, is a mere stripling of a girl with only 56 years service. She is recognized as one of the world's leading experts in this highly specialized business. Lily is giving Sean Connery the first stage of the full treatment. She is gouging out a hole as a guide for positioning an eyeball socket. A heated metal ball the same size as an eyeball is used to melt away the surplus wax. 
She has to be extremely careful to avoid melting the eyelids. At this stage, the slightest slip can ruin the whole head. After melting, only a thin layer of wax is left, which is easily cut away. An eyeball less Paul Newman awaits to have his famous clear blue eyes inserted. The false teeth used are the same as those supplied to dentists. The eyeballs are made of glass and are similar to those provided as false eyes to humans. All the necessary colors and shades are available. Robert Redford has just had his eyes inserted and is now due for color toning, skin texturing and hair. About 20,000 hairs will eventually be implanted into this head of Walt Disney. Every single one is individually inserted into the soft wax by means of a forked needle. It takes about a week to complete one head of hair. Hands are subjected to the same meticulous treatment as faces. The unkempt appearance of a parent's hand is only achieved by hours of patient work. are also individually inserted into the backs of all male hands. Figures made in this small workshop have been exported to museums and exhibitions all over the world. Fine examples of the firm's expertise are these fierce-looking Campbells and McDonald's being made for a museum of Scottish history. Gathering dust in the storerooms are the plaster casts of every head the firm has ever made. Here are the famous and the infamous, the remembered and the forgotten. The original model of all the heads is made in clay but since this eventually cracks, a duplicate in wax is kept so that, if necessary, a new plaster mold could easily be made. Visitors find the workshop has a strange atmosphere. You get the feeling you are being watched. being watched. Well, it's all quite elementary, my dear Watson. Whatever you do, don't lose your head. Off with his head, I say. Off with his head. The horror of cruel and bloody moments are hardly diminished by the passing centuries and the artificial blood and gore. making life-size images of ourselves in fiberglass and wax, as we are at our best and our worst, 
seems to have reached perfection. Where do we go from here? Perhaps the only possible improvement would be the real thing. But who, after all, would be willing to go 24 hours a day without a lunch or a tea break? And how many volunteers would you get for that dungeon? nature improve and perfect, even at times when there seems to be little point in doing so. Mechanical figures, arms that move, eyes that wink. It all sounds pretty grotesque. It's enough to drive a man to drink, unless of course he's already there. 